You're listening to Remotely Warm, a podcast that educates, entertains, and inspires you to take your life back from the office commute. I'm Rick, a former beer rep who left the warehouse to become a voice actor and digital creator. And I'm Colleen, a remote work advocate and consultant. We're going to speak with some of the top professionals who have managed to avoid the commute as they share stories from the most inspiring to the most comical, all while working remotely. Man, this sounds awesome. Let's clock in. How are you? I'm okay, man. You look great. You look exactly the same, dude. You're supposed to get older. No, last time you saw me was on the remote DrupalCon thing, and you commented, I remember while I was talking, on one of the sessions, you commented that I looked like Anderson Cooper with my... I had I had a swoosh a swoosh going of of, of like white Anderson. of gray hair. Yeah, you were like, look at Jeff with his Anderson Cooper going on. I mean, oh, he's a silver fox. <laughs> he is. That's what the, that's what that's what I call myself, silver fox. <laughs> I mean, you're not too shabby, Jeff. That's why you know that's that's what I say. You're not too shabby. You know what I mean? Well. <laughs> I'm getting up there, but uh, yeah, no, my goal is to offset the the gray hair with with anything else I can. I don't understand I know my t- not too shabby. I don't get it. It's like, what does shabby mean, first of all? And if you're too shabby, does that mean you're just a degenerate piece of shit? I don't know. I don't think so. It's like, oh, it's not half bad. Well, is it half good at least? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it was popularized by Adam Sandler in his Hanukkah song. And after that, it became like a, a yeah. thing everybody says. True. It's got to be a New England thing, Kaleem. It's got to be. Definitely, definitely. Do you remember the Hanukkah song that he did, Rick? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, he said, um, oh, who was it that was a quarter Jew? Harrison Ford. <laughs> oh, yeah. He goes, Harrison Ford's a quarter Jew. Not too <laughs> shabby. Too shabby. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That is great, man. Welcome back, everyone, to Remotely One. I am your co-host, Rick Haney, joined by my esteemed colleague and co-host, Colleen Clarkson. Hey, buddy. Fly away. Fly away. Are you excited? I am excited. (laughs) Don't fly away, man. I need you here. I couldn't do this without you. Okay, yes, you could. You're the voice of remote work, sir. Of course you could do this without me. Well, I mean, yeah, but, I mean, (laughs) come on. (laughs) <laughs> this is like a yin and yang kind of thing, right? It really is. It really is. Or salt and pepper. You know what I mean? Oh, you know, we should have called the show Ebony and Ivory. Oh, Ebony and, and Ivory. Ivory. Nah, maybe we shouldn't have. Nah, nah. Hey, everybody. Since you know how to find us, do us a huge favor and go to ratethispodcast.com forward slash remotely one and just leave us a review. We would be so appreciative of that. Again, ratethispodcast.com forward slash remotely one. And if you could do that for us, we would be ever so thankful. Since 2015, Remotely One is one of the largest communities of remote work professionals with over 3,000 Slack members and 5,000 email subscribers. And if I'm not mistaken, that number is still climbing. It's free to join. Go check it out at remotelyone.com. And with that out of the way, Colleen, why don't you give us a teaser or two about today's guest? Oh, man. I just take a deep shirt breath. Is... Take a deep breath. You're scared, aren't you, honey? I am You're scared. Super scared, dude. Like my shirt's all soaked through. I got the the maxi pad shirt on with the maxi oh. pads underneath. Oh man, I'm so nerved up. Our guest makes me so nervous. But today, Rick, our guest, they're originally from Concord, Massachusetts, so they're a fellow masshole. Oh, wicked, wicked pissa. Maniacs and massholes together, sir. We're we're, we're okay. We're all right. Let's um, see where this goes. I think it's going to go pretty well. I think it's going to go pretty well. Um, our guests, they currently reside in Arlington, Virginia, though. So, you know. That's okay. Guest, is that the South guest? Uh, I believe it is. Okay, yes. It I is. would think so, yes. I'm yeah. pretty sure. It's pretty sure. I'm, I know it's warmer in Virginia than it is in Maine. That's for damn sure. Yeah. And Concord, Mass. Concord. <laughs> Concord. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Our guests, they started their career as a consultant back in the day, mm-hmm. doing large scale government IT projects back then, like for the US Navy, the EPA, the US Department wow. of Defense. Yeah, 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 yeah. They know what they're doing. That's big time. Mm-hmm. But, Rick, just like both of us, okay, our guest is a former musician, Rick. Ooh, tell me more. Oh, yeah. Our guests, they were in a heavy metal hair band, okay? What? For, like, the 80s heavy metal hair bands? Telling you, telling you, like, with Dio, Rat, 
They have oh long hair. Oh, my God. Yeah! <laughs> they even had the <laughs> cigarettes rolled up in the shirt. They played guitar in the band name, oh. Rick. You ready? You ready the yep. band name? Without warning. Oh, my God. That's so 80s. <laughs> I love so it. so 80s. It's so it. 80s. I'm disappointed I never knew this about our guests when I first met them. Wow. Guests, do you have a video of this band? Not that I'm aware of. I don't think there's any video evidence. There's only audio evidence, and it's not good. You know, I was praying that you were going to tell us that somewhere there's like a blown out pair of leather pants and a t-shirt with like a claw mark going across the chest where it's ripped to shreds. <laughs> the claw mark. The claw yeah. mark. Oh my gosh. All I can think of is uh, yeah. the dude from Prince there. Oh my gosh. I love that. Shirts versus the blouses. <laughs> <laughs> but Rick, after yeah. our guest was famous being an 80s metal band, okay, yeah. in 2001, he founded Phase 2 which is mm -hmm. a digital agency, and listen to the brands that this damn company has worked with. You ready? Mm. Pinterest, MasterCard, Fannie Mae, MLS, Whoa. Johnson & Johnson, the Pac-12, the U.S. Huh? Department of Energy, and Whoa. the Smithsonian, okay? Those are we not small them. names, my friend. No. No, we get big guests here is what we do, Rick. We get big guests. Well, we're aiming for the stars. Oh, the stars is where we're going. Yeah. Listeners and viewers, please give a warm welcome to the CEO of Phase 2, Mr. Jeff Wolf! Oh, yeah! yeah! Woo! 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 Settle down, studio audience. All right, kids, settle down. Down in front. Down in front. Right down back there. This is an right assembly. Down. All right. <laughs> Woo, thanks for coming that on, Jeff. That is a Jeff. hell of an intro. A hell of an intro. <laughs> wow. We try. Yeah. Well, we're trying to get on your level, see. We're doing this big. We're, we're trying to elevate ourselves as well as you for coming on the show. Yep. Yeah, well, yep. it's not hard if you try. <laughs> well, nothing's hard. Nothing's impossible either. <laughs> You got to put in some effort, no, though, not. Chief, right? The accent yeah. never dies, Bub. It never dies. No, it Bubby. downloads. You just got to work for it. <laughs> do people look at you like, where the hell did you come from if you talk like that in Virginia? Uh, no, I don't know. I, I saw somewhere online a uh, Boston accent was rated the sexiest accent. Wait, oh, no I, shit. Remember Everyone that. in Massachusetts I remember... rated it that way. Oh, no, no, no yeah, for probably. real. Like the, I remember that. I think it might have been in like even the Rolling Stone map, but like, it Texas was like number two, but New England was number one. They left. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you can thank Maki Mark for that. I thank Maki Mark for about everything. <laughs> yes, you. Yeah, do. he's got them yes, good vibrations. Do. Good vibrations, Chief. Yeah. Hey. Uh, true story. I went to high school with a girl who was one of the backup singers in the Funky Bunch doing the Good Vibration background. Yeah. Should've was she cool? Something. She, she was cool. Tamika Powers? Yeah, I was scared to death of her. <laughs> he remembers her name specifically. He's still afraid to talk badly about her. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. She'll hurt you. <laughs> oh. Tamika. Tamika, if you're out, hit Jeff up. He just wants he just wants to hang out. That, well, now we gotta have Tamika to on the show. Don't no don't doubt. don't hit me. Just say hi. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for being a part of this. Uh, I don't know what kind of operation this is, but we're gonna find out by the end of the show. <laughs> right, Kaleem? Oh, we're professionals. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Hey, we've got a bunch of questions, but before we begin, I, I want I have one right off the top. In your blog, you mentioned there's a specific reference to remote first does not mean remote only. Can yes. you expand upon that viewpoint and also about your perspective on gathering with intention? Yeah, I mean, okay, so we weren't always a remote first company, right? We had a we had an office at one point that had the capacity to get up to about 100 people comfortably, very comfortably. We had a whole floor of a building. We started hiring people remotely and that trend never stopped and COVID just accelerated the whole thing. But we maintained offices for a long time in different areas of the country. And uh, so I think like the only office we have left is our headquarters here in Arlington. And 
It's sparsely attended, I think would be generous. But the idea is that we want to provide environments where people can work at their best, right? So whether it is in an office or it's at home, it should be comfortable. It should work for you. And I think the other aspect of it, the intentionality is about making the best use of time. So what we did a couple of years ago in response to what we're hearing from employees who were working remotely was too many meetings, right? So the idea was yes. how do we reinvent our meeting culture and break the habit of bad meetings, getting into mm. a space where like, for instance, when you show up for a meeting, you've got an agenda and everybody knows why they're there. You don't over invite or under invite, you, just the right people are there. Show up on time, you have an agenda, you get through the work and something gets done, right? Instead of meeting to meet. You know, these days it's just too easy to go on Slack and say, hey, you can jump on a Hangout or a Zoom and like, let's just talk about this. And it, so we were trying to break that distraction that it created for employees to just get pinged and then sucked into a Zoom to go solve something. Interesting. In regard to phase two, you started that in 2001, I believe? Correct. 2001, okay. just a couple Congrats. weeks after September 11th. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So wow. was that your first experience with remote work or did you go back, do you back farther than that? Well, I'm trying to think. Yeah. Yeah, it was actually. Um, everywhere I worked before that, it was required that you be in the office. And of course, we're going pretty far back, right? So you're talking yeah. 90s now. My first job at uh, System Integrator, as you mentioned, doing government work, not only did you have to be on site, but when I started, you had to wear a suit and tie. And, mm -hmm. you know, you had to wear that every day to work. Yeah, it's a far cry from my prior experiences. You decide to create this agency in, in, in 2001 and, you know, a digital agency is a very broad, right? A really broad term. Um, I don't want to simplify your agency by any means, but for some of those people out there, they build websites, they build apps, they build anything that's digital on, on the web. Can you just talk about when you started the organization, how did you even start experimenting with the idea of not being in an office? Right. Like like you just explained, you had a, a career of going to work in a suit and tie. How did flexibility even come about in those early years? I mean, obviously, you told us you did have an office. So then how did you even start creating um, this, this flexibility? Yeah. So so when we first started the company, the founders and I were all working for another agency. We didn't call it an agency back then. I think we called it a web development shop or something. But our primary client that I worked on and folks worked on with me was the NFL Players Association. And that was downtown DC. Deal. Yeah. So we the were NFL actually PA. building the salary cap system for the NFL. So the only system that calculates the salary cap. So high stakes, we were on site there and we were doing our work on site and they, we just kind of took over the law library there. There was like this dark internal conference room and the four of us would sit around the table with our laptops and that was like our place like we owned this dark little room and so we were remote to begin with when our prior company fell apart after september 11th we started this company out of the ashes of that so we went to the head of the players association and we said who is hall of famer gene upshaw and we said oh hey God. i got some good news and some bad news the good news is the system's ready for the 2001 season or we were in the 2001 season, but it was good enough to make it through. Bad news is we have more work to do. And would you hire us if we could build a company? And he said, yes. And he cut us a check and uh, I went down the street and found a bank and we started. And that's what we said. So we started from this, we weren't working in our own office. We were working in someone else's office, right? Right. And then we would have to have business meetings that weren't about that client. And we felt bad about having those meetings in their space. So we only did their work in the space. Right. And so we had to find another space. So we got an office called Starbucks and it was, <laughs> it was free. 
more or less. I don't know if it was totally free. I mean, you had to you had to buy some stuff. There was actually a Starbucks near my apartment in D.C. on Capitol Hill that had an upstairs conference room. And if you made a donation to charity, you could rent the conference room for an hour at a time. So we made a lot of donations to a lot of charities. And we used this conference room upstairs in Starbucks. And that was like our place that we met. So that was definitely a very early remote experience for the company from you know day one like literally founded 20, that way 22 years ago that doesn't even sound right that you were doing this 22 years ago and just to clarify you're just throwing out the nfl pa just very lightly and casually are you telling me that you helped build a software for the nfl pa to manage the salary cap am i hearing that correctly yeah yeah 100 holy shit <laughs> and we continued to manage and maintain that custom software that we wrote for, it, I mean, I want to say seven, eight years into the, the company. So they were a client for a long time. And this, the system wow. d did more than that too. It calculated royalties and marketing activities and things like that. So we had financial transactions as well. It was a very interesting, bespoke custom system that we loved. I mean, it was like, it was our baby, you know, we managed that thing for years. What was it like working with the, those high level, high profile people? That must have been fairly intimidating up front. From Starbucks at that. Yeah, from Starbucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, like what's interesting is it's like you get in, it's like any client you get into, you start to kind of take the facade of the brand that you know and you, and that sort of falls away. And you get to know the people and they're regular people and they're people like you and you develop friendships. Um, mm. Just some really awesome people there that we, you know, to this day, you know, I think are just some of the greatest people we've ever worked with. They're wonderful human beings. But the interesting thing is then learning the business, right? So like you learn the business of like football. And in this case, you have sort of a labor versus management type model that comes out of the South, out, out of the collective bargaining agreement. So the NFLPA is like the union that represents the players and their mm -hmm. interests. And the league is like management, right? And so there is a negotiation that goes back and forth. And in this case, the salary cap was a key component of that. It's, you know, part of the business rule of how it all comes together. You have to maintain a cap on cost per team to create the kind of competitive environment that they want to have in the sport. And so getting into that and the rules, it's like the book was like, literally the book is this thick. And I remember like in the early days, like they just like gave us the book and I gave it to my, my partner, one of our co-founders, Scott Hockett, who's one of the most brilliant human beings on earth. And I just gave him the book and I said, your job is to learn this whole set of laws and rules. And, oh, and then we have to turn it into software. And so that was like how we got started with it. But it was really neat. Those were very special early days. And, and they definitely had an impact on who we became as a company. Jeez. So kind of going back to those days, um, just kind of knowing the progression of phase two from the Drupal community. Shout out to the Drupal community. Open source software. You know, it's free software for our audience who may not know, open source, it's free software that the community contributes and maintains. Uh, Jeff, can you talk about some of the leadership lessons that you learned around remote work that, that you took from working in an open source community? Yeah. What are some of the things that you took from that that allowed you all to kind of transition to more of a flexible workspace? Yeah, that's interesting. There's definitely a connection, right? I think between open source and working remotely and certainly culturally that idea of freedom, you know, you could start with that and just think about how that works. But open source software in the case of Drupal is, is being built and managed by a distributed team of people all around the world. So in the case of the Drupal project, you have a million people around the world that are contributing to the, to that software, right? And they could be in Kuala Lumpur for all we know. So the concept of an office or even in that case, a company doesn't exist. It is a community of people who by their very nature are distributed, right? And remote. And, and in some cases there are not just time zone challenges, but there are language differences. So when you 
go to a DrupalCon as Kaleem, I know you've, I know you've been, you get this awesome experience of these people who come from all over the world that have this shared interest, but yeah, the sense of like, you know, an office is like, you know, is foreign in some cases. It's literally, we do this work from wherever we are and it all gets contributed thanks to the, the beauty of the internet and how we can collaborate on GitHub and, you know, of course, didn't start on GitHub. That was a lot later thing, but but through distributed means. So I think there's a direct connection. I think as a company, we we started with the idea that people can do productive work from wherever they are. And that was influenced in part by the experiences that we had, not just in the Drupal community, but prior communities, open source communities as well. Once you see the productivity that occurs in writing software distributed across the world, you no longer think that you need to be standing across a desk from somebody to get something done. Mm. Mm. Yeah, wow. it is fascinating. I remember my first time because I, I, I fell into it to Drupal and open source by accident. Like a lot of people, you know, I was doing some university work and they're like, go check out this thing. And the first event I went to, I was like, wait, all these people work for different companies and some of these yeah. people actually just don't work at all. They're just freelancers <laughs> and they're all volunteering their time from yeah. all over the world to contribute to this thing. It really is fascinating and I could not believe like how it all came together and it could work. So it's a really interesting story. Absolutely. Yeah. Jeff, you're obviously a, a well-seasoned remote work veteran. You've been at this for what? just over two decades now. What are some of the biggest challenges and struggles and I guess maybe even like growing pains that you've had mm. as uh, you know, leading a distributed team? I think, you know, one thing that, that it took us a while to learn up front when we were hybrid in the sense that we did have offices and then we had remote employees as well. But initially until we learned how to do this culturally, the playing field wasn't even. So Little things matter. Like, for example, you go into a conference room when you're, you know, let's say there's 10 people in a meeting and five of them are in a conference room and five of them are remote. It's natural to just sit down and face each other at the table. And in some cases, people would just turn their back to the camera, right? And so it, it's the stuff that we had to learn doing it the hard way. We would get feedback from employees and they would say, hey, they were so happy to work from home back then, right? It was like, they didn't want to, you know, <laughs> they didn't want to rock the boat, right? So it was like really subtle, like, hey, I really like the freedom that I have. But like, you know, could you not sit in front of the camera? Because it makes me feel a little alienated, you know? So it's like things like that. Those are the things we learned over time. And a lot of it honestly came down to just awareness, awareness of like time zones, for instance, when you set meetings, awareness around like, the things that people can't pick up on. So the nonverbal cues, right? The facial expressions, the side talking, the, oh, well, we pre-gamed this in the kitchen, you know, like that kind of stuff. You know, yeah, it's difficult for people to understand until they get in that environment. And then, you know, I think the great thing for for us, the, the not the great thing, I'll just say the the silver lining about COVID is that there's no one left who hasn't experienced being on the other end of that, right? So now everybody has some sense and some empathy of what it feels like to be the remote person in a hybrid call or meeting, right? Yeah. And so I, I, you know, I feel like that was the last barrier that we needed was for no one to not be that person for some period of time and know all of it. But again, we were doing this a long time before that. So it does make me sometimes wonder were there still things that we needed to work through? And I'm sure there were that we weren't aware of in, until that happened. Wow. Wow. Right. Because all that time, you know, you're just grinding, doing big projects, making it happen. And it wasn't until 2020 where everyone was forced to be fully remote yeah. that you were able to see some of those cracks. Kind of commenting on that piece do you feel just kind of want to get your opinion on where do you feel like this remote work thing is heading now that everyone has experienced mm. that right like like where do you think we're going next what's the next iteration we're seeing a lot of return to office do you mm. think that sticks do you think the workforce will ultimately kind of 
drive the change? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm definitely on the side of I think it's here to stay. I think hybrid will be a preferred model for most companies, and I think where the details are going to get have to get worked out is what are the rules of hybrid? When can you be hybrid? When can you elect to come in or not? So what I hear most people saying these days is we require people to come in on Tuesdays and Thursdays, right? And I I don't know about that. That's That doesn't work for us. And the reason it doesn't work for us is because the whole philosophy that we have is that you should be working where you can do your best work at the moment that you're doing it. So let's just say, for instance, you have a giant presentation to a client on Friday. Maybe Thursday is a great day to be work from home heads down because you're in that really good production mode, right? Or conversely, maybe you and a few other people really want to get together and prepare for that. And it makes sense for all of you to come in and be in one place so you can work together, right? Whether that's the office or, you know, coffee shop or whatever. So our philosophy isn't about requirement. It's not about when we want you to be in a certain place. It's about when and where are you going to do your best work? And that really is going to be up to the individual. And so that's why I don't think this hybrid set of rules that people are laying out is going to be the most productive option for employees, which isn't to say that companies aren't going to get away with requiring it to work that way. Right, right. Like, so you're on the side of if you're going to have an office make it 100% choice. I'm, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but like when you're talking about hybrid, are you kind of leaning towards, Hey, if, if it's going to be successful, it needs to be choice. I think, yeah. Use it when it suits you use it when it's appropriate. It's an asset, right? So one of the things that we love about our building and the whole reason, honestly, I don't know if the whole reason, but one of the big reasons I even chose to renew our lease was that there's a great conference facility in the first floor and they have these really nice laid out rooms, beautiful, like totally renovated, like, and a nice, like just common area. You can hang out with couches and stuff like that. So a lot of the times we use it, like I'll have my executive team, some of whom live in other places, they'll fly in and we'll do our workshop there, right? We're not even using the space that we rent upstairs. We're just <laughs> using the conference, the conference area space. that comes with the rent because it's so nice. Yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, that's an example of a time when you might want to do that, right? But then the next day, they'll fly home and I'll get up and I'll work here and I won't go into the office because I feel like it's a good day for me to get stuff done, unpack from the meeting, get my notes, speak you know, be comfortable, kind of be in my space because I'm out of meeting mode and now I'm into post meeting mode. And so I feel like that's what works best from a personal productivity perspective. So back to your question to me, what's the future? I'm not sure that all companies or all leadership of companies that are mandating a hybrid policy on certain days are thinking about the productivity of an individual so much as they're thinking about, oh, we got to hang on to our culture. So these are the days we see each other. These are the days we don't. Right. And I think that's the wrong philosophy. I agree. I agree 100 percent. So, Jeff, we noticed that you created the phase two remote work playbook, which is free and open to anyone who's interested. What was it that that motivated you? to create such an amazing free resource? Uh, open source. So as we talked about, you know, open source has a culture of contribution, whether it be code or documentation or knowledge, right? And I, I would say that I uh, haven't opened that in a while. I'm, I'm guessing it's a little bit out of date, just to be honest, um, because we did that during COVID in large part because we had been doing remote for so long that we'd gathered up a lot of this stuff internally in our own documentation, everything from how to have good headphones to 
making sure that your camera settings are good. And then it was like all of the cultural things about setting the meetings and the stuff that we've talked about. And we just thought like, hey, what we see right now when COVID hit is mainly our clients struggling to move into that environment with no experience. And we thought, all right, well, we got all this stuff that we give new employees. Let's just package it up and let's put it on the internet and let's just give it to people. And then people that work with our clients can send that directly to them as a PDF and say, hey, we want you to have this and maybe it'll help you in your transition. And it turned into really good conversations with our clients at a time when we really needed to be having those because we couldn't meet with them in person. And so this became a facilitator of non everyday work conversations. So in addition to talking about the, the budget for the project or talking about, you know, testing the, the code or, you know, having a design review, now we can also consult to you on wait on things that we've learned about working remotely that hopefully we can impart on you like best practices and things you haven't thought about and clients really appreciated it because it really came across honestly as like like you said it was like a free gift it's like we learned all this stuff here it is we can um help yeah we can help you <laughs> right like we see how you're struggling with this it, it's not easy to do in one day especially if you're a big company well kudos to you man for thinking about that and i'm sure internally you're like geez we're sending this all the time to our employees as we're onboarding them why not just like let everybody have it so kudos to you for all the stuff that, that you've been doing really good stuff amazing so jeff could you share with us a comical or inspiring moment that you've had while working remotely <laughs> um yeah you can't see him right now but i've got my golden retriever here laying on the floor um Good dog, good dog. Yeah, I've got two of them. I've got a puppy now too. So I've got two of these guys running around here. Um, but uh, I did have a client meeting one time and this was, this was about probably two years ago. And he's walking around behind me. And you know, at one point I commented about a dog and the client said, oh yeah, bring him out. It's great that he's here. It's great that you have your dog behind you in the meeting and all that. And, you know, they're all looking at him, admiring him, and he's walking around and they're like, what's he doing? And, and all of a sudden he just barfs all over the floor. <laughs> oh, it's just like everywhere. Uh, yeah, just kind of like. And it's like the dog noise. The yeah, dog noise. the noise. <laughs> and it just, yeah, it's yellow bile and it's just, yeah, there's toys in there, you know. <laughs> you know, oh. What? And it was like, and, and it, you know, like the, everybody's watching because they're all like, look at him. He's so cute. You know, and then that just happens. It's like, ooh. <laughs> It's such, fire. A Massachusetts, it's such a Massachusetts story, too, although you're not in oh, Massachusetts. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> wicked, Bob. That's great. Friggin' man. dog that's... puked all over the carpet again. <laughs> <laughs> wicked lot of puke coming out of him. <laughs> that's, I, I just wish that, like, in my mind, I, I can hear, like, the tones of the people, like, oh, oh, yeah, the dog is yeah, so yeah. beautiful. It's so beautiful. And it's like, Blah, and then they just start crying. <laughs> oh my God, is Ruffy okay? Is Ruffy all right? Oh, oh that's, yeah, that's great. Right, right, exactly. There's always <laughs> one guy that says, "I haven't seen that much puke since Cappy's Liquors." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one, Jeff. Good one. I think that's the first good dog one we've had. It's it's yeah. hard to rebound from that, like without you know, <laughs> a little disruption to the meeting. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Well, Jeff, you've been a, a, a tremendous guest. We, we learned so much from you, you, and we we can't thank you enough for coming on the show and certainly for tolerating our juvenile humor. <laughs> now I'm right there with you. I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. Um, where can our listeners and our, our audience, where can we find you? Yeah. Uh, well, definitely on LinkedIn. And, you know, I'm not doing the X thing anymore. I've got an account, but I don't really use it. But um, I get you. I get you. Yeah, I think, you know, I want people to check out my company, phase2technology.com. I mean, we're doing great stuff, and I that's probably where I'd like people to go. Um, awesome, man. Jeff, yeah, thank you so much. It's great seeing you. Next time I'm up in the Northeast, I'll hit you up, bro. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you, man. All right, man. I'll talk to you later. Peace. You've been listening to Remotely One. Visit us at remotelyone.com forward slash podcast for upcoming episodes. Subscribe to our YouTube channel 
and download our episodes on your favorite podcast app. Hey, hey, don't forget to clock out. <laughs>